Hello and welcome. My name's Jack and this is my Throwback Attack podcast. This time we're going back to a classic CBBC show and some magic memories. Enjoy. So next up, it's a discussion about the BBC Kids show, Simon and the Witch. To talk about the show, I have with me actor Joe Grossi. Hello there. Hi there. How are you doing, Jack? Not too bad, thank you. Yourself? Yeah. Um, obviously, this is COVID year, so being very careful. Uh, being very careful also because my mum and dad are in their 80s, and I'm very lucky to still have my mum and dad, so... Absolutely. Well, I hope all is well. Now, for those listening, um, what role did you play in the show? I played the role of Hopkins, the butler, <laughs> who was also a cheeky cockney. Yeah, so I was wondering how long it would take for you to put the voice on. <laughs> it was uh, That was one of the iconic parts of the character, really, in that um, around Lady Fox Custard, he was all proper, received pronunciation, but around the kids, around the witch, it was a uh, cheeky cockney. <laughs> yes, and her name was Fuchs Custard. Absolutely. And uh, before we go into talking about Simon and the Witch in any great detail, um, I want to know about your background, so why you got into acting, and and a brief summary of some of the other roles that you've played. Okay, well, when I was at primary school, I used to enjoy doing the reading. And In those days, there was an assembly every day, and there was always something from the scriptures. And the sort of top sort of 10, 12 kids in the school, the oldest kids, used to do those readings. And I don't know, I used to get really nervous, but I kind of liked it. And I I kind of liked um, really saying the words, uh, trying to understand what they meant. And my favourite one was always, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because I used to think that was just so beautiful and really nice to read. And I remember the head teacher... I think I read it two or three times over the, those two years. And she said to be very well read. <laughs> so um, there's no theatrical background. My dad is a tiler, works in the building industry. And my mum was a hat maker. She was a milliner, also very good at uh, dressmaking. And she made curtains and goodness knows what. She, my mum and dad were always busy making things. But I went to grammar school. So I was sort of clever at school and I did languages. And we did, um, in the first year, there was a thing called the Junior Drama Festival. And I just participated reading a couple of poems in the class, got very nervous, running to the loo every five minutes before 7.30 when the curtain went up. And then we did um, a play the following year. And I actually played a sort of a servant character. Um, It's a play called The Government Inspector. It's a Russian play. It's about 200 years old. Still gets performed. And there's a guy, it's a mistaken identity. And this guy's sort of, they all think he's an inspector from Moscow. So they're all trying to butter him up. And I play his sort of cheeky servant. So that was when I was about 13. And then I did plays all through school. And then I went to um, an all boys school. And at the bottom of the hill was an all girls school. And they decided to put on a production of a play called The Crucible. And that's written by Arthur Miller, who was a famous American playwright. And the leading role in that, um, John Proctor, uh, in the film <laughs> recently, 20 odd years ago, it was played by Daniel Day Lewis. Mm-hmm. But I auditioned for it. It was my first ever audition. And I got the leading role, which really put a few noses out of joint because there were a few of the other kids who all just thought they were going to get it. Mm-hmm. So um, I was talking to my mum about that the other day. And she said, You were very good in it. Then I went to university, didn't go to drama school. I studied law, didn't like it joined the drama society I was in plays every year and then I decided I wasn't going to be a lawyer when I told my mum and dad a bit of disappointment um I timed it I told them after Christmas and before New Year (laughs) so I didn't want to go into the new year with them thinking I was going to graduate and become a lawyer um so then I worked for a year trying to earn some money and the idea was to go to drama school but I didn't earn enough money so I just I bought a copy of the stage and uh, bought a copy in those days, Time Out, which is a magazine that just tells you, you know, about clubs and gigs and stuff like that. It used to have a thing in the back where they advertised acting jobs. It was called Theatre Board. So in September, I got a job through the stage in a local play in South East London, um, a theatre called The Albany in Deptford. 
And so I was involved in that production. And two weeks later, I auditioned for a show that was touring by a company called Moving Parts. And I got that job as well. And that was in Time Out. And that's how it started. And then from that, you meet people. And we used to do theatre and education. So um, after about six months, I was performing in secondary schools and doing plays about different topics. And then through auditioning that, because I ended up sort of co-running the company, we auditioned a guy called Denzel Kilvington. Now, Denzel Kilvington, years later, um, was on Grange Hill. Yeah. <laughs> the biker. <laughs> Do you know the character? Uh, no. Did you watch Grange no. Hill? I'll have to, I did at one point, but I guess it depends. Um, everybody no, has their own right, era. Don't don't yeah. No, I keep forgetting how young you are, Joe. <laughs> Yeah, not an old dodger like me. Anyway, um, <laughs> so let me see. Where was I? Anyway, Denzel, uh, he just come down to London from Scunthorpe. He was very funny. He was 18 and had a punk haircut, bleach blonde hair. He wore a tight tartan suit and just came into the audition. He was brilliant. So he joined our theatre company. And then within about 18 months, we started doing comedy double act. And we called ourselves the KGB because his surname was Kilvington with a K and I'm Grossy with a G. We thought KG, KGB, that'll do. So we did the comedy circuit and we played a lot of colleges and universities and we just did comedy. And we did that for about 18 months. Then Denzel wanted to go solo and he was very good on his own. He was even on New Faces, and um, which was like a talent show. And then um, I got together with another friend of mine and we did comedy. And then there was a sort of a gap. And then I said, look, why don't we do all three of us together? And we agreed that we'd put our best material together and we did a show. And we performed it, first of all, this was in 1986, in a place called the Canal Cafe Theatre, which is in um, northwest London in, the, in a lovely little place on the canal called Little Venice. And this is a place where they, to this day, they still do lots of cabaret and they do a lot of um, sort of um, topical stuff as well. And we ran our show there for about one or two weeks. You know, no one came to see it. No agents <laughs> didn't get any reviews. And then we thought, well, we'll have another go at this. And then there's another theatre in Battersea. And that used to be called the Latchmere Theatre. And it's now called Theatre 503. And that, that really was like a little theatre. You came in from the back and it slowed down with about room for about six or seven people in a row and about 10 rows. You get about 70, 80 people in and stage at the bottom. We did our show there and um, I got spotted <laughs> by mm. David Bell, who was the director and um, actually he was only the director on Simon and the Witch. And he got back to me some months later and told me about this character Hopkins. And would I be interested? Well, what do you think? Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, I went, there used to be a, a, a little studio in Shepherd's Bush, not far from Television Centre. And it was called Lime Grove. Mm. I think it was sort of between Shepherd's Bush and Hammersmith. They used to do all sorts of filming there years ago. And then the BBC used it for filming. So I went to this Lime Grove Studios, which is like tight around the back of, goodness knows, it's probably not even there anymore. And I went into this funny little room. And it was about five o'clock in the afternoon. It was a little bit dingy. And I met David and I read for it. And... Um, and yeah, within 24 hours, he'd offered me the role. Ah, oh, very cool. So, one of those things that was pretty much right place, right time then? Well, you know, one thing about doing gigs and doing lots of them is um, you've got the sheer repetition, so you get you get better at it. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes you're not careful, you can be a little bit automatic. But we always tried not to be. We always thought, it's a fresh audience, let's go out there, let's just give them a good show. Um, this is like doing the um, the cabaret act, and because uh, most of the time we were a touring double act when I worked with Denzel, and even when I worked with Rick, my second partner, again it was just the two of us. But um, it was it was nice to be in a theatre in one place, have a routine. Uh, Denzel's wife Deb, who is still a good friend of mine, she mixed all the sound and did the lights. So um, it's it's funny we, we we borrowed a video camera because in those days video cameras were quite expensive. And so we, I borrowed one and we stuck it on a tripod. And the funny thing is that in one of the sketches, Denzel did like a, a Mickey Tate magic trick. And um, 
the two people who he chose at the audience were David and his wife. So it's so funny that the day that we were that I was spotted, um, as it were, um, is actually captured on video. I didn't realise that years later. That's really nice. So a treasured memory. Yeah, it was. Absolutely. And so um, with, with Simon and the Witch, was Hopkins your first TV role? No, it wasn't. But what happened was is that I'd, I'd always wanted to be, well, actually, I always wanted to be a film actor because at school um, I was uh, very good at was top of the class in German and French. And my Italian dad got really annoyed that I couldn't speak Italian. <laughs> so I had Italian lessons. So I actually speak four languages. So I had this sort of little ambition when I was, I don't know, when I was about 16, 18, 20. I love the idea of like being an actor who, oh, I don't know, I went to, I'd go to Germany or Switzerland, do a bit of filming for a couple of weeks and come back to England and then maybe get a little job in France. I thought, oh, that'd be great. And then I sort of put that ambition a little bit to bed and I just thought I'd really like to do TV. So once we were doing our comedy act, I started to write to casting directors and I wrote to all the BBC producers, especially comedy and also children's television. And um, we started to get some auditions. Uh, this would have been about two, three years before Simon and the Wish. So for um, breakfast television, um, there used to be a thing called TV AM, which was, um, it was on sort of Saturdays and Sundays, kids shows very early in the morning. And we auditioned for that. And um, what else did I audition for? Oh, yeah, I met this guy who was called J. Nigel Pickard, and he was really important in children's television. He discovered all sorts of people. He gave Sandy Toxvig her first mm -hmm. job, people like that. Um, then I also auditioned for um, uh, the television in London, it used to be done by Thames Television. And so I auditioned for Thames. I went up to Manchester. And I did a couple of auditions for children's television in, for what was called Granada TV in Manchester. And, um, and then one job came along that was kind of perfect. I wrote to the BBC and this lady director, I didn't know who she was. I found out afterwards that she, she was sort of kind of a legend, really. But her name was Moira Armstrong. And she was directing a Sunday night programme, one of those shows that's on like 8 o'clock on a Sunday. It was called Bluebell. And it was uh, about this woman who formed a dance troupe back in the 1930s, got a job in Germany, went to Germany and was in Berlin just as Hitler rose to power. And in episode one, there was a scene where they required someone who could do comedy, do cabaret and speak German. And I got the job. So that was my first TV job. Then on the strength of that, I got another little job um, for another sort of... Um, uh, one hour show this this show went out at nine o'clock on a friday on itv and that was called to heaven to hold and i was in a couple of episodes of that and uh, just just playing a waiter in a restaurant and as those were my first tv jobs i thought oh, this is really easy <laughs> nothing to do it because they're nothing nothing at all <laughs> so i ended up doing bits of building work to try and earn some money and then i i um i got an advert and the first advert i did in those days, cigars mm. and cigarettes, um, well, cigars definitely, um, could be on television. Imagine a television ad that someone smoked a cigar. I know, yeah. And um, of all people, David Jason, Del Boy, comes to visit this bloke in hospital and, um, and smoking his cigar. And this bloke is head to toe in plaster. All you see is his eyes and his little mouth. And that was me. So uh, my first advert was with David Jason. That's so, cool. That's very cool. It was very cool. Yeah. And then guess what? After that, nothing. <laughs> which is which is why we started doing the cabaret shows. And mm. then a year later I got spotted and Simon the Witch and did two series of that. Cool. And um so and, when uh, you were uh, offered the role of Simon the Witch, um kind of what was the, the next steps from there in terms of learning the role, uh, you know, meeting the people involved, that, that kind of thing basically. Because of the other two T V jobs, I had sort of some idea of how things work. When you only play a smaller character, um, you they do a thing called a script, a script reading, where you all sit around the table. A, a table read is another name for it. Now, I ought to remember it. I think I did do the table read for the BBC job, where I was the, um, the comedy guy in German. I don't remember doing one for the second job, 
with Simon the Witch, we all went to um, this sort of what looks like a really boring office building. And it's on um, the underground at a station called East Acton, just a little bit west of where the BBC studio is. And this was the BBC rehearsal rooms. And that was the most amazing place, if you like TV, you could possibly imagine. Because you go into the entrance and then you had to prove who you were. And then there was the lift. And on the first, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth floors, there were three rehearsal rooms of different sizes. And everything the BBC did that needed rehearsal was rehearsed there. And they used to mark out on the floor with different colour sort of strips of sticky tape, the room, the door. Um, we'd have funny old beaten up junk shop furniture, terrible table, terrible chair, beaten up old sort of sofa, any props. And that is where we would learn our moves. And that is where we would just practice sitting up, sitting down, coming in, timing your cue. And, and because everything was marked out on the floor, it meant that when you went in the studio, it wasn't any bigger or any smaller. So you knew, especially me as Hopkins, she would ring the bell. I would open the doors. I would close the doors. I would say, you rang, mom. And then I would walk one, two, three, four, five steps or whatever. And it was brilliant because in the rehearsal room, it was identical to the studio. So it meant in the studio, nearly nothing went wrong. So that was just from the acting point of view. Um, apart from going to the read, um, when I met everybody and I met Joan Sims, who of course is a legend, um, we, did, we just read all the scripts around the table. When you do the rehearsal on day one <laughs> at this actor room, you finish at half past 12. You only do about three and a half hours work. And then everyone goes upstairs to the canteen on the top floor. And that is when the magic happened because over there is Lenny Henry. There's Ben Elton. There's this other famous actor and actress. I mean, I could rattle off lots of names that probably don't mean anything to you, but I saw so many, so many people during the rehearsal period. So it was quite a normal thing for the, you know, the lift door to open and someone really famous to get in and they yeah. go, hello. <laughs> because of course they get recognised. So, mm. you know, we say hello because they get recognised. And it was just extraordinary. I imagine so, yes. I mean, um, obviously some of it's before my time, but I've always had a fascination with television and television production and the studios. And um, I'd never went to that particular building, but I did go to Television Centre um, for one of the tours yeah. once and I, I once went there to see a game show being filmed and it was just really cool to be there, to be somewhere where so much television history had happened um, and a lot of people have said that the, the rehearsal building was was fantastic and, and, and am I right in thinking it's not there anymore or it's been repurposed? Uh, I think it's repurposed. I think what happened is, is that the BBC is under a, a lot of pressure. There's not much in the way of children's TV. There's they're squeezed on budgets. They have to be very commercial. They have to come up with shows that can be big hits because then they can earn independent money and, you know, say, look, we don't need to be supported. We can run a business and sha-la-la. And I think that that building was just one more thing that just got either sold or, as you say, repurposed. I doubt if it's even a BBC building anymore. But it was like a golden period. The nickname for the canteen um with with the actors and, and people in the business was um the, they called it the acton hilton <laughs> i mean mm -hmm. the food was just that like really sort of ordinary food but the people who went there it's just you didn't know who you were going to meet really it's really very special um yeah, yeah so that's all gone television center um so th this is the way the filming worked in series one of Simon and the witch i mean about oh nine episodes I think nine out of 13 episodes but because not much action happens at Haughty Hall um I only used to get a little bit of a look in if you think about it, the first series of Simon the Witch is, is in the school it's nearly all in in, in the classroom mm -hmm. and the witch's house and Simon's house and all the rest of it so there wasn't much for me to do so all my filming I think in the first week 
was done on the Thursday and the Friday in the studio. So you'd rehearse on a Monday, three and a half hours, go upstairs and have a lunch. Same thing Tuesday, same thing Wednesday. Of course, by Wednesday, you were expected to be slick, know your words inside out, know exactly where you were work, working and, and walking towards and what you were picking up and when you were sitting down. And so when you, went, when you went in the studio, it could all be done really quickly. So they'd have three rehearsal days, two shooting days. And so on that Thursday, going to Television Centre, um, it's just fantastic, <laughs> sort of going through those doors and being allowed in. And it's a funny sort of round building. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, is. so the corridor is kind of curved and you keep going through all these double doors, which um, are also there sort of soundproofing. And we filmed in, you know, I can't remember if it was Studio 2 or Studio 3, but one of the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. What they did was is, um, they built Haughty Hall, that, the room that you will know as Haughty Hall, and they did all the filming on it in two weeks. So all the scenes at Haughty Hall with Lady Fox Custard and me and all the various visitors like Sally and everyone else who went, and the big party scene as well, they were all shot in Thursday, Friday, and then another Thursday, Friday. And that's it. Yeah. I was finished. I mean, it took them longer to make the whole series, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then because, um, as David, the director, said, he said, your character went down so well, Joe. He says, we've written you into it a little bit more in the second series. So then in the second series, I'm in 11 out of 12 episodes, which meant that I, I actually worked on the show for four weeks. That's really cool. And... Um... I can see why the character was popular with children, because really, although, you know, he was Lady Fox Custard's butler, um, he was always down with the kids and kind of on their side all through the show and, uh, you know, kind of yeah, getting was. them out of scrapes and stuff like that. Yeah, but absolutely. But, I mean, also, um, I, there, there were no scenes like that written. I think if anybody had come into the place and taken the mickey out of Lady Fox Custard, I think Hopkins would have dealt with them. Because I think he, at the end of the day, he, he liked his job. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he had a good little number there. And as he sort of teased Cuthbert in that scene, he said, I'd like to be the butler to the queen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know whether he, he really did have those sorts of ambitions. It's hard to know. But, um, yeah, he was, he, was, he was there with the kids. He was covering for Cuthbert. I mean, you know, poor Cuthbert. He's got this pushy auntie making him eat his crusts and, you know, because he's so brilliant and he's such a genius. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of pressure to put on a kid. And so, you know, as Hopkins, my sort of, you know, my, my grasp of who Hopkins was is that he just thought, oh, this kid, he should just be allowed to be a kid. You know, I can cover for him. He can just have a laugh with his friends, you know, like a normal kid. Mm -hmm. And so that made me a sympathetic character, you know, because I was on, I was on their side. I'd cover for them. Yeah, <laughs> certainly true. Uh, there was some great, great scenes with you and, and, and the kids um, and with Joan Sims as well. I mean, what was it like to work with her? Because, like you say, a legend. Uh, everybody's watched the Carry On films. <laughs> well, I, I didn't go to drama school, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it came to learning about how to work for the character, and work for the camera, um, did my stuff because I only had those three days in the studio for series one. When I watched it on TV, I thought I was a bit too theatrical. It was almost as if I was on a stage rather than in a studio. And what I wasn't used to was the fact that, you know, the camera, um, it, it sees even small movements. I mean, it, it, when you watch movies and when you watch uh, well, actually quite a lot of TV as well, um, you'll see that the actors do very, very little. You think of a show like Peaky Blinders, you have very, very little facial movement, speaking very softly, but it works on camera. Well, I found out the hard way, <laughs> really, on series one of Simon and the Witch. So I just wanted to make sure I got it right. But certainly the following year when we did series two and I was in the studio more, they had these great big televisions, which were monitors. So whatever the camera was showing, whether it was camera one, two, three, which I think occasionally they used four cameras, but mostly it was three cameras, I think. It would switch. And as an actor, if I wasn't in the scene, I could just watch. So I could see the real action happening just behind. And I'm looking at a TV screen, just as you or I do when we're watching telly. And I just watched Joan 
and it was just a lesson in how to work for the camera because when she was young she was trained in a place um there was a company called the rank organization they used to make movies in england they also owned cinemas so they used to own the odeon cinemas all through the 50s and the 60s and whatever and they had a thing called the rank charm school all sorts of um, people who were famous from the 50s onwards went there and joan um she went through the charm school and they taught her how to work for the camera she gave me a couple of tips but most of the time I just was there I was in complete awe of her <laughs> not when I was with her I just spoke to her as a person because mm -hmm. you know she, she was just a person um but when I was watching her work and doing scenes with her it was ah it was so exciting to work with someone that classy yeah and I bet you thought, you know, because you were only a couple of years into acting at that point, that you probably never saw yourself in that position and to be working the longer. But that, that, that must have been really nice. No, we well, don't know what's going to turn up, you know. Um, and as I say, what tends to happen is that things, what's happened in my career anyway, is that something good sort of happens. So, for instance, one of the assistants, uh, they're called um, floor managers, an assistant floor manager. His name was Terry. He worked on Simon and the Witch, but he was also working on the Lenny Henry show. So there was a Lenny Henry show Christmas special that was being filmed just a few um, months after we filmed Simon and the Witch. And um, Terry put in a word for me. So I got a little scene uh, in the Lenny Henry Christmas show for 1988. So I got to work with Lenny Henry. And I thought, oh, this is going well. It's great. Thanks, Terry. Nice little job. And then in 1989, again, no TV. Do you know, I couldn't even get an agent. Um, I've got a, a folder, it's in front of me. Um, and it's about two inches thick. <laughs> and it's rejection letters from agents. And I tried to get, um, you would have thought that Hopkins, Butler, sympathetic character, you'd have thought I'd get a job in a panto. Yeah. I wrote all these pantomimes. No one gave me an audition. No one, not a single audition for a single pantomime. I thought, what's going on with the world? This is mental. So at the time I had, a, um, I was with this uh, German woman. She was my girlfriend and eventually we married and we were together for 21 years and had two kids. She said, you want to come live in Germany? So in 1990, I did, which was kind of the kiss of death to my acting career in England. But it was the kiss of life. To a whole new career working in Germany. Um, so we came back to England in 1992, got married. I did all these adverts, including that Argos effort that you, <laughs> that you so kindly found and sent me. I did five commercials in six months. It's unbelievable. And they paid really good money, it gave us a nice start to married life. And then I started to pick up jobs in Germany. So I used to get on an aeroplane, go over to Germany, do these little jobs, come back again. And, um, and then again, it dried up again. It's just so, it's like it runs hot, it runs cold. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I got a little job on Grange Hill, a couple of episodes of Grange Hill. And um, the character who played Jimmy in Simon and the Witch with the glasses. Yeah. With the broken glass with the plaster in the middle. Mm -hmm. He was also in Grange Hill. Played a, I think he played a character called Barry. And um, so he went from one children's show to another, which was um, very well done. And uh, and I ended up working with him again. <laughs> it was quite funny working with David. Yeah. Uh, good, good little actor, really sort of quirky and cockney. You know? um, and uh, just other, just bits and pieces, bits and pieces. And then the year 2000 came and not much more. And then... All of a sudden, um, in 2005, I got a role in the Da Vinci Code. And obviously, this is like another league. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what was good about the Da Vinci Code was the audition, not the part I did. Because when you see the film, I'm only in it for a few seconds. Um, but I auditioned for one character and the audition went really well. And Ron Howard, the director, was four feet away from me, you know, barely a metre and a half, just the other side of this little camcorder. And I 
did the line straight to camera and I did it with an Italian accent and you could cut the air with a knife and he and the casting director they just said that was really good really good but they realized I'm too young to play the character so Ron said um, to the casting director can you get the scripts so he can read the other part and the casting director was a bit embarrassed. He said, oh, I haven't got that script with me. <laughs> he said, well, Joe, Joe, do, do, do you mind just hanging around and maybe come back in a few hours' time when we get all of this script? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I sort of went out and um, the casting studio was right next to the British Museum. So I was free to get in. I had nothing to do. They told me to come back at two o'clock. So I thought, oh, what am I going to do with myself? So I kind of walked around the British Museum. Do you know what? I can't remember what I looked at because I was in this sort of daze. And I came back at 2.30, did another good reading because I felt so confident the morning went so well. And as it transpired, I was 20 years too old for that character. Oh, dear. <laughs> but the audition was a fantastic experience. And um, you know what they say, like in life, it's the, the failures. That's what you really learn from. Mm -hmm. And that was a failure because I did something wrong. I mean, I failed to get the job, but um, a long time ago, I, I learned a lesson about auditions, which is when you audition, they don't, they choose someone else. It's not that they don't want you, they just choose someone else. And the way I always describe this, I describe this when I talk to young actors and, and, um, and also just people I meet who are interested. Imagine if I've got a box of really delicious chocolates, right? 24 delicious chocolates, each one as beautiful as the one next to it. And Jack, if I came up to you and I offered you that box of chocolates, you'd choose one, wouldn't you? Yeah. But that doesn't mean you don't like the others. No. You will make a choice, won't you? Because yeah. otherwise you don't get chocolate. Absolutely. <laughs> what casting is, what happens is the casting director presents this array of delicious chocolates. And then the director and the producer and the writer, whoever's making the decisions, usually the director, is spoiled for a choice, but they will choose someone. And that's what happens in casting. So when I don't get a role, often I just think, oh, curses, that job was really well paid. <laughs> so I just think, oh, the money would have been really handy. But... Um, I can honestly say that in the last 30 years, there have only been about four auditions that I came out afterwards and I really kicked myself. And I thought, oh, God, I really messed that up. And um, so, yeah, unfortunately that happened about two years ago on something. Um, mm -hmm. The director was a bit, he was a bit snappy with me. I think it's because he looked at me and he thought, no, no, he's wrong. And he was actually the director of the film, which is quite unusual. Usually at the first casting, you only meet the casting director, but the director was there and he just put me right off and I didn't do a good read. I was so cross with myself afterwards. So anyway, so in that one, I knew I wouldn't get the job. Mm -hmm. I think that that whole idea about being chosen doesn't just apply to acting. I think it applies to all sorts of areas of your life. You know, people go for all sorts of jobs, all sorts of job interviews, People apply for so many things online. I didn't even get an acknowledgement, blah, blah, blah. You know, and the, the thing that should stop you from going mad is that the chances are they chose someone else. And as frustrating and infuriating as that might be, it doesn't mean that you weren't any good, that your pitch for the job was rubbish or below average or whatever. It just meant that they made a choice and it wasn't you. Yeah, I like that. That's uh, a nice way to look at it. I might actually use that myself in the future if I ever get turned down for something. No, I like that. It's very, very cool. Oh, really? <laughs> Honestly, anyone who's listened to this, I mean, you know, take it with you. I, I, I tell that to all sorts of people, not not just people who go into the acting world. I mean, you know, my two boys, they're in their 20s now. Mm. You know, we talk about that sort of thing all the time, yeah, you know, because yeah. you're not always, you're really, really, really lucky if your first audition goes well and then, you know, and, and then you just think, oh, this is great, this is easy. But there are so many people who find fame early who then kind of burn out or 
they get passed over for someone else and they got to deal with that you know and um you've got child actors um sometimes say on simon and the witch and a couple of other kids shows i've worked on you often see usually the mum sometimes the dad they always have someone with them and um and there's always a teacher so on simon and the witch um they would only allowed to work depending on that age if they were 12 they could only work for say two hours if they were 13 they could work for three hours or four hours and the rest of the day was with the teacher and you did lessons so you know they weren't running around in a studio having a laugh they sit down with a tutor and they would have proper school lessons and they'd have homework and they'd be set targets plus learning their words plus doing a bit of filming so um some of the kids loved it so you get someone like naomi harris who of course um was in uh, series one at Simon of the witch and of course now she's money penny in james bond yes i know talk about a career jump career change <laughs> slightly and then you look at someone like um sally from simon and the witch nicholas stapleton mm -hmm. yeah and much time after simon and the witch that she was playing mandy on eastenders and um and she was a regular in eastenders playing this real oh real sort of tear away character she was mandy was like trouble you know and um and of course in simon and the witch nicola you know she, she played sally as like a troublemaker and a telltale and you know um and she's got she's got real fire as an actress and um and she's still working she's still working whereas hugh who played simon um he didn't want to do it anymore he still works in tv but he works i think he's got a production company yeah i read something about that somewhere yeah well i found out about it accidentally and i, I actually stuck something on my on my facebook page that i call it simon and the witch memory board i think i call it and um, so I haven't really got a, a lot of memorabilia, but um, I was hoping to um, try and get some photos and some input from some of the other people on the show. Um, but, you know, there's different, different gauges, you know, different ranges of interest, really. Not much interest. I've written to a couple of agents, but I don't even know if my messages get through. But of course, that might all change because my my acting life is about to get a massive boost because i'm in the next james bond film oh okay and it was of course postponed in mm -hmm. april yeah right because of everything that's happened in the world and i thought well that makes sense i understand and then they moved it to november the 12th and of course they said no we're moving it again and i completely understand that um that film cost a lot of money to make yes i can imagine <laughs> They need, well, apparently it's a quarter of a billion dollars. That's, I think, how much the film costs to make. And you really need the cinema interest. You need that opening weekend all around the world, packed cinemas, people, you know, paying for the tickets. And of course, the cinemas need it because you imagine how much popcorn and Coca Cola and, and all the, you know, all the sweets and stuff that get scoffed when you're in movies like that. Yeah. So um, they're holding it back so that when it comes out with a bit of luck, by then it'll be safe and um, or certainly safer and we can go to the pictures again and go to the theatre and watch football matches and do all that normal stuff. You remember? Yes, absolutely. I'll have my fingers crossed for you for when that, that, that comes along and happens, all being well. Um, in terms of the other cast members, um, obviously we haven't mentioned like the main star, Elizabeth Spriggs, who played the witch. Um, I, I thought she was a, a fantastic casting of that character. She really played it quite well, I thought. Yeah, she's a really superb actress. I mean, she's she did things like the Royal Shakespeare Company, and but um, when 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 you sort of watch her playing the witch. And, and the way that she used to speak, and, and very breathy, and to her nose, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, she, she gave the character um, this lovely sort of wackiness. But as time to see her in other shows, every now and then I've glimpsed 
something like the witch in another character she played in another production so i think she kind of had that one up her sleeve but um she was brilliant because she, apart from all her skill apart from the fact that she always knew her words always 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 knew her words she was really energetic and off screen when we're in the rehearsal room she chat with all the kids I think I don't know whether she had grandchildren herself but she was always very um easy to talk to and she kept a good good rapport with everybody and she was like an excellent person to have around I'm not the best person to answer many questions about this because of course as Hopkins I only really worked with Joan um there was the the big party at the end of series one, when everyone was there, the mayor and, and, and Simon's mum and, and Miss Feeble and you know, all, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we were all in one place. And then there was another big finish to series two. But those were, well, there was a lot of actors on set. And so I, I think there might have been in series two, there was one scene where the witch came round and she came bursting through the door and of course, as Hopkins, I couldn't stop her because she's just this ball of energy. So I, th I think there might only have been two or three scenes that I actually worked with Liz. So I just, um, during the rehearsal period, when you weren't, you know, doing your scenes, you just sit on a chair and you'd look at your words or read the paper. But I just watched the others working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like when I was at school, when I first started acting, when I was 13. I mean... I only had small roles, really. When, you know, when you're young at school, the big kids get all the best parts. But I used to just sit on a chair and just just watch them. I was fascinated with it. And I, I'm, I'm just the same now. It doesn't matter whether I'm on a film set or whether I do a really modest shoot. I, I just love everything about the whole process of, of learning the words, delivering the words, trying it a different way, um, different movements little things with your eyes it's great absolutely and um that scene where the witch goes into haughty hall um i think one of my favorite hopkins lines in that um because it, it was always like little sarcastic lines that he came out <laughs> with that you know um lady fox custard was oblivious to it's that bit where she turns her cake into a lobster and he says shall i remove this crustacean or shall i fetch the mayonnaise <laughs> i love that line <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many kids got that though. I think when you were six years old, you probably just thought he's holding up this this lobster and putting a silly face. <laughs> so I, I think kids just laugh because it's silly. Yeah. Um, but you know, as an adult, yeah, it's a great joke. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing about that because it's it's on my show reel. Um, and if you actually see the way I'm holding it, I think it looks quite a lot like the um, like the Enterprise from Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> have a look at it again it's just i'm holding it in such a way that it almost looks at first glance like a model of the of the enterprise from star trek i'll Maybe definitely it's just... have to have a look i'll have to have a look again now yeah. <laughs> and um i mean once uh, once you've done the show um like did you keep in touch with many in the cast and crew afterwards well i i tried to keep in touch with elan elan who played cuthbert he was such a nice lad really um uh, sort of shy and kind of almost like a dormouse really um like the dormouse from alice in wonderland at the mad Hatter's tea party sort of seemed a sort of a sleepy character um out of all the kids he was the one who forgot his words and um and he used to get teased a bit for it but he took the teasing quite well um and he was a complete nutcase for the beatles the, the, the band, the Beatles. So even though, you know, it was way years and years before his time, he loved that band. He loved their music. And so I, I like the music of the Beatles. Um, I taught myself to play guitar because I wanted to write songs. So I thought I need to play guitar. I'm a pretty good singer. So the first book that I bought was the Beatles Complete and it had something like I don't know, 180 songs in it. And um, so th the first songs that I learned were Beatles songs. So of course this went down really well with Elan. 
you know, so we used to talk about be much more about the Beatles than I did. And I thought I was pretty good. Um, so I stayed in touch with Elan and I used to speak to him on the phone, I don't know, two, three, four, five times a year or something for the first years. And then he was in a play. Um, he was in a play in Shaftesbury Avenue in the West End. And um, he just had a couple of scenes in it. So I went and saw him in this play. There he was walking out onto a West End stage. I thought, wow. <laughs> um, it was terrible tragedy, though, with Elan. His family, they went to Australia and he got meningitis. And the, I, I found this out a few years later. He was 22. He died. Mm-hmm age of 22 from meningitis and at that time he was working as a dj and i i i was just breathless when i found out and i, I remember his sister because uh elan's mum always used to be there as his sort of chaperone um while we were filming and rehearsing and sometimes his sister came and i'm facebook friends with his sister and every year we, um, on Elan's birthday, we all do a message on the Facebook page. And, um, yeah, I, it's, I, it's awful. Yeah, awful. absolutely. I remember telling David, the director, about it, and he was just flabbergasted. Yeah. I mean, David's wife um, was the teacher for the first series of Simon Witch, by which I mean not on screen. She was the tutor for all the children. So David was the director and his wife was teaching all the kids. So, you know, she, she knew um, Elan as as well as any of us did. And um, yeah, so I, I went to a screening of a film and this was a long time ago though, a film called Chunky Monkey. And it was produced by a guy who I sort of met a few times uh, because I tried to get into film producing about sort of 15 years ago. And I met all these people. And um, and Nick Nicola Stapleton was in it, Sally. So I just sort of stepped outside and she was just at a table chatting and she looked at me and her mouth just fell open. She said, oh, my God. I said, hello, Nicola, how are you doing? And uh, she, she was, I think she was just pretty aghast to see me, really. But it was, it was lovely to see her. I'm trying to get in touch with Naomi yeah. because... Um, when the Bond film premieres, there's absolutely no way I'll get a ticket to the premiere because the theatre's not big enough. There's too many big wigs will be there. But um, I'm hoping to use the Bond connection to be a, a way to sort of get in touch with Naomi and maybe she'll have a little message and uh, um, then I can maybe put something on the Simon and the Witch Facebook page. Ha <laughs> ha. Fingers crossed. It is lovely that you do that, actually. Um, and, yeah, terrible terrible um about um elan but that's i guess that's why you do the the the, the facebook group as well because unfortunately quite a a fair few of the cast are no longer with us um joan sims elizabeth spriggs and a few of the other well the older ones inevitably you know yeah Yeah. exactly um it was a long time ago (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah in terms of what went out on the show um do you have a favorite moment or episode and then do you have a favorite moment that happened off camera that nobody saw that's kind of like a nice memory moments on the show just standing there watching the monitor and watching joan look up which camera am i on blah 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 sitting there smoothing out the creases in her dress yeah sitting up she had a lot of trouble remembering words so anything that she did the scenes when she was on the telephone and just reacting to something on the telephone and then ringing her bell and uh, i have to say just nearly all of those moments with joan were just fabulous her in the studio in the second series she got herself into a bit of a tiz um she said david can we change something with the shooting schedule this is the director she said, it's too many words for me. I just can't learn my words. And, and she got a bit tearful. So this was upstairs in the, in the canteen, in, in the Acton Hilton. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the others were sort of not there. There was just David, me, and Joan. And she, she got really, she said, I just can't do this. She said, it's just too many words, David. 
and my heart just went out to her. I said, Joan, listen, if you want to stay here for another hour, two hours and three hours and go through your words, I'm really happy to go through your words with you. I said, any help? I said, really, I, I don't want you to be struggling. You know, I, I, and it was all I could do to sort of stop myself from saying, you don't know how wonderful it is for me to be working with you. <laughs> but I almost said it. I think she, she got the picture. But I think she felt so lifted by the fact that David as a director, being very professional, and I being probably a bit more emotional, that we were so supportive of her. And um, so she then got over it. She got over her little crisis. And then she did the scenes. And, of course, you've watched those programmes over and over, so you yeah. know how good she is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was the perfect casting for that role, I think. So yeah. if you want to know about a, a backstage thing, um, I suppose in a way that that's also backstage. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that didn't really answer your first question. <laughs> But one of the most, um, one of the loveliest moments for me was there's in series two, there's a scene when she goes jogging. And uh, so Lady Fox Custard's wearing this bright pink um, sort of headband and, and, and tracksuit. And she's jogging on the street and Sally's there telling tales as usual. And Hopkins is with her. And I think I'm wearing a hat. So we're out there jogging. And um, so it's just a little a little scene that we filmed in Beaconsfield, um, just west of London. And um, we were, it wasn't very cosy. On a big production, you get like a trailer. Um, so on the films I've worked on, I get my own little caravan. It's very cosy. You know, you've got like a chair and, you know, running water and uh, there's a canteen and it's lovely. You just think, oh, I can be here all day. Can, can, can we not do any filming today? I'll just enjoy myself in my trailer. <laughs> Yeah. but on a little show like Simon and the Witch we just used to kind of she just had a chair a fold-up chair and I remember we were by the lorry that had um, some of the camera equipment in and it was sort of empty and we're sitting by this lorry and she said when we worked on the carry-on films she said it was it was it was always this dead time in between and she said me and Kenny and, and then she started, you know, she's obviously got affectionate names for all the carry on scene. She said, we would just go over our words over and over and over again. All of us would just, do, in, in the acting trade, we call that a word run. Mm -hmm. Just do endless word runs. And if someone said, do you mind, can we just do that again? I just want to make sure I got it. The other actors nearly always say, yes, of course. And you just got this lovely sort of camaraderie. And it was, it was so lovely. And I think she only told me that story because having that little meltdown um, when she was worried about learning her words. And um, that, was, uh, that was really sweet because I then imagined, you know, all those, all those cheeky comic characters in the yeah. Carry On film <laughs> back then being very serious, very serious about learning their words and, and saving all the funny stuff when the camera's rolling. And backstage just really really caring about about getting it right and then lucky us you know all these years later we watch those films and even if they're a bit old-fashioned they're very polished I mean the acting and the, com the comedy is really good yeah I totally agree and I mean like you say a, a little bit dated but at the same time quite timeless I mean everybody still enjoys them uh, no matter what age I mean I grew up watching them as well and um like you say, very polished and very, very funny as well. They they did churn out a lot of films. I mean, it was, it was uh, what's the word for it? It was like a machine, really, just constantly putting these films out. But it um, must, must have been great to do and, and nice to hear her anecdotes, really. Yeah. The, the worst thing about the carry-on films is that nowadays, so even though I'm only in the Da Vinci Code for a few seconds, Every time it appears on TV or gets streamed or something like that, I get a couple of pennies because I get what they call residuals. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a very, very small shareholder in the profit. And Equity, the Actors' Union, was fighting for that for years. And what used to happen in movies is Joan, in all the carry-on films, everyone she did, she got paid once and she never saw another penny. 
which I think is mm. criminal. <laughs> yeah, very much so. <laughs> That's how it was in that place. So it's ironic, really, because Simon the Witch, with all the repeats, um, probably earned a much more money than the yeah, Carry On films. Yeah. Wow, you because she got paid, because the BBC will always pay you your share. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you wouldn't have thought it, would you? And as a result of the repeats... I mean, obviously, for one, I got to see it because I wasn't old enough to see it the first time around. But as a result, uh, did you find that for a very prolonged period of time, you'd get recognised by people? Yes. <laughs> a long time. It, it was quite funny when I was out with... Well, you also got to bear in mind that um, I have cousins. My mum and my dad. Dad's from a family of six. And... Um, but he's the second eldest. And my mum's from a family of four, and she's the oldest. So what it means is all my cousins are younger. So, of course, my cousins were all at school going, my cousins on Simon of the Witch. <laughs> so we'd go out shopping or go to the shopping precinct, and there will always be kids who'd come up to you. So there was a, yeah, there was a, a fair amount of sort of signing autographs. Um, I've autographed like plastic bags, goodness knows what else. And see, nowadays, you don't do autographs. Everybody tries to get a selfie. So I, I, I don't know what will happen um, in, in the future if I have something sort of high profile. People, I suppose, are going to want to do selfies with me. But with kids, I, I liked it because, um, you know, kids, they, they're quite direct. They're a little bit shy or they're a little bit lippy. The weird thing is, is, of course, kids who saw me and then when it got repeated again, when you watched it in whenever it was 2000, and, when did you say 2000? I think it was 2000 something? at the start of the millennium. Yeah. Yeah. So as a result of that, um, I used to some, I think the last time this happened was about three years ago. We were in a bar somewhere and um, I was just chatting and, you know, I was with, with my wife and maybe a few friends. I can't remember who I was with. And there was this guy who was at the next table and he was kind of looking at me and, and sort of got really sort of friendly. And he said, I know you from somewhere. <laughs> and this is like three years ago. And, um, and I said, mm, did you used to watch children's television? And he went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even all these years later, um, he recognised me from the show and that was like 20 odd years later. To be fair, you don't look any different to when you were playing a <laughs> role. Yeah, Listen, seen. there's only one good thing about going bald when you're young. <laughs> is that you get older, the change isn't very dramatic. No, I can kind of <laughs> sympathise. I've started to <laughs> receive myself. To say so, Jen. Very kind. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, the show is very popular, but for whatever reason, only ever had two series. Do you know why they decided to finish it after such a short run? Yes, that is um, Angela Beeching. She was the, oh, I'd say, legendary children's television producer. Um, Angela knew that with child actors, two years is a pretty good lifespan for those characters. Now, she wasn't in the business of making a show like Grange Hill, because, of course, what happens in, in a show like Grange Hill, which was, you know, set in a school, is that when the kids first go to Grange Hill, they're 12. But, of course, they can be in the show for four, five, six years. Because if they do their GCSEs and then maybe stay on to do A-levels, you watch them grow. And so if you're a kid watching that show and you're 12 years old and you're watching a 12-year-old actor and you carry on watching that show till you're 16 or 17, there's a character on that screen who's growing old at the same speed as you. So you get a connection. But the kind of shows that Angela did, um, they were normally just two series and um and that was her reason she says no we don't do more than two and um and that's the main reason was that um they just made um it worked out about 25 26 episodes which is um enough to do what they call in tv land a season so if you do two episodes a week over 13 weeks that's 25 26 episodes so that's why that many shows were made. Um, if you watch TV now, every now and then, say in September, they say, new season on BBC One, blah, 
blah, blah. And then they'll start giving you a preview of all the shows that are coming up because the new season starts in September, just like the new term at school or, or at university. And then at Christmas, those shows run out. And then after Christmas, you've got spring season. And again, it's just like school. So you've got like a 12, 13 week period and you need TV shows to fill those slots. So two series of Simon and the Witch is enough for a season and they can sell that in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, wherever, anywhere they speak English. And um, that's how it's done. And that's why they only did two. I, I, I understand the reasons, I suppose, now, now that you mention it. But um, sometimes you watch Listen, certain as shows. As a fan, it's rubbish. As a fan, it's yeah, rubbish. as a fan, it's rubbish. It's like you want more. But I can, I can totally understand it, you know, that they were going to grow up. Um, so, yeah, no, that makes that makes perfect sense. But it had a it had a lovely ending, I thought, because, I mean, we spoke about the school series and series one, but series two was mostly focused on Valdini's cafe, saving that. And they do in the last episode, and there's that lovely scene where they throw a party and there's like all the balloons coming down and, and stuff like that. I thought that was that was nice. It was really great. And I really liked the way that um, David sort of filmed that. Because towards the end of that episode, he saw, you saw this character smiling. You saw that character smiling. And like everybody had their little close up. And if I remember rightly, I was opposite um, Sarah, uh, who played um, yeah. uh, Simon's mum, Sarah Winter. And we're sort of at the table. And I think we're just sort of eating an ice cream or something, sort of smiling cheekily. So, you know, almost suggesting the idea of, hello, hello, what's going to happen there? Is Hopkins <laughs> going to start going out with Simon's mum? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, you know, it's sort of like a little cheeky, flirty scene. And then, of course, the final scene is the witch and Simon just sort of grinning, and then that's it, you bring it to a close. Yeah. So I think it was really nice that, um, that, that David... I think very, very skillfully just tied it all up, left it all nice and neat and tidy. Yeah, I think that's that's very true. It is a, a nice ending mm. to the series. I was reading on the memory board actually before we, we spoke, and, uh, you mentioned I was re- going back through the posts, and there was one anecdote that I thought was funny because you, you, what you don't realize is what people use to make certain props or substitutes. So I remember you saying that the, the ice cream in the cafe was actually mashed potato, I'm guessing, so it didn't melt uh, under uh, the studio lights. <laughs> It's so brilliant. Actually, mashed potato is everywhere. Um, there's an Elan story, a Cuthbert story. Um, you, you might remember that at one stage they go out on a picnic mm, and yeah. uh, and Cuth falls into this poo. Yeah. And, and you know, he ends up in a cow pap. And um, cow pap was also made of mashed potato. Gosh. But it was obviously brown they put like gravy mm. powder i don't know how they did it but anyway you ended up with this sort of brown cow pad and even though it was mashed potato even though it was fine elan he just couldn't do it i mean david the director had to really persuade him to do it he said look honestly it's not poo i said but it looks like poo i, I really don't want to fall into it david it's going to be horrible i don't want to do it he got really upset and i, I don't know I'm, i think that david might actually put his finger in it and tasted it and just said look it's potato taste it. i don't want to taste it oh gosh yeah. there's, there's quite a lot of mashed potato in series two of simon the witch yeah, and it's funny, really, because it's it, it, on like a completely random tangent. About a year after Simon and the Witch was the launch of Bodger and Badger, which was um, mashed potato. That was the slapstick prop that they used in the show for the whole 10 years. So it seemed to be the BBC go-to if they needed uh, to make something that looked like something else. It must be quite versatile. Like, you know, it's good stuff, you know. It's organic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not plastic rubbish, no chemicals. No, it's no. Just... The other thing I thought that was quite funny as well, and it's like whether you'd whether you'd get away with it now, because um, you said that you're from an Italian background. Valdini's Cafe was played by somebody who's quite obviously not Italian. It was that that <laughs> that over the top, you know, it's a nice day kind of you know Italian. I don't know. I'm just doing a terrible impression. No, you're right. They couldn't get <laughs> it was away that, with it. It was now. that terrible um, fake Italian that they were doing. I'm sure you're probably quite offended. Like it's not like that. Well, no, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I I just let it go. It was comedy, and <laughs> it um, was. Yeah. You know, C- CJ had had worked with um, Angela before, so mm. she knew him from previous productions. Mm-hmm. But I, at the time, I remember thinking it was a bit odd that she didn't find an Italian actor because they are out there. Yeah. But I think what she liked about him is that, you know, he's got that dark wavy hair and yeah, it's, you know, yeah. quite big and, you know, he's sort of a clowny 
actor so he was in you know he was a good choice and um but yeah the accent yeah <laughs> my, my agent tends to send me up for italian roles so um you know because i speak italian mm-hmm. so if i was playing a character like valdini i would be more authentic in how i would uh, express myself because this is how a real italian would speak mm-hmm. but of course he's just an english geezer so <laughs> he yes. just did it in the cheeky way yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, it was amusing, but you know, it was just a kid's show, I suppose. At the end of the day, um, but... yeah, and he was a good, and again, a good colleague. It was a good troop of actors. Yeah, it really uh, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it didn't matter who. I mean, Charles, who played the mayor, you know, he, he, he was a great big blustering man. His eyes looked like they were going to pop out of his head. So enthusiastic, he thought he was going to pop. <laughs> and uh, it's just great fun watching all these different people working. Yeah, no, it was it was good, and it's what made the show work. And um, I'm sure you were surprised all these years later that one day, and I was surprised as well, that the show was released on DVD recently. Yeah, I was really chuffed um, because, you know, there's money in nostalgia. Mm-hmm. And um, what happens with, um, with what they call distribution is that if someone thinks they can get a DVD into the shops or to get it on Amazon or whatever, they'll go to the BBC and say, look, we'd quite like to package out these DVDs because we know that DVDs are kind of a little bit old fashioned now, but there are still people who want them. And, you know, there's a lot of nostalgia for old shows. And this particular uh, company of the distributors, they made a deal with the BBC and they managed to get hold of, you know, original copies so instead of what you and I were putting out with, which was transferring a VHS onto some sort of digital format, and uh, because you get all the dropouts with video, don't you? you get all the little fizzy bits and the white yeah. line, and mm-hmm. uh, so suddenly to get a reasonably pristine copy um, was uh, was really lovely. And uh, so I I bought a copy for me, copy for my mum, and then I bought about another six copies. <laughs> It was my, my cousins who were, you know, who were young when Simon and Witch first came out, are themselves mothers now. So they have children. So last Christmas, I gave my cousin's daughters a copy. <laughs> there are kids who live downstairs to me as well. And they're falling in love with the show as well, even though it's on clunky old DVD. And they can't get enough of it. They watch it over and over and over again because, you know, when you're a kid, you get enthusiastic and, uh, you know, it's a crazy show. <laughs> it is, and it's nice that it, it's bringing it to a, a new generation, really. That is, that's really nice. I like that. <laughs> the other thing as well is there's no violence in it. There's no nastiness in it. Um, there's no... It, I mean, Sally's like the meanest character in it, and even though uh, Nicola plays her really well, she's a really sharp actress with a real sharp tongue, um, you know, she's... If, if it was a pantomime, you would just boo when she came on stage, wouldn't you? Just go boo, yeah. which I would see Sally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so it, it's it's a lovely show in that sense because it's more about fun. It's about mischief. It's it a is. Lot of mischief. Yeah, that's. I think that's why I liked it as well because I like mischief. I liked being silly, and it's the fact that you know a lot of the you know a lot of the adult characters are silly. Hopkins was really secretly behind Lady Fox Custer's yeah, back with kids and yeah, uh, you know, the witch as well. Yeah, a little bit of a joke. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but of course, you know, yeah, he had to be straight because that that was his job. But yeah. um any chance he, he he could to be a bit, you know, be, as you said, down with the kids. Yeah. Uh, and it was, the, was it was like the, Finn, yeah. Yeah, and it was the change in accents as well. One one minute it would be the the uh, the, the posh tones and the next minute it would be Cheatney Cockney. <laughs> That's right. That no, was fun to play. It was fun to play. Good. I'm still friends with um, David, the director. Um, oh, cool. He's retired from TV. And, um, he um, he did audio books. So he used to work in a studio with some really famous actor and they would just read an entire book for the audio book market. And he was involved in a company doing that for years. But he's just retired now. Takes it easy. And he lives in uh, Wiltshire. Um, with his lovely wife. I mean, I remember when um, in series one of Simon and the Witch, the word got out that Kathy, who was the teacher, as I said backstage, young actors, uh, word got out that she was pregnant. Mm. 
And of course, for series two of Simon the Witch in 1988, um, she wasn't teaching anymore, but she came in one day with a pram and we all met Emily. Oh. <laughs> so Emily is like a Simon the Witch baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, nice. It sounds like it was a, it was almost like a one big family, really, I suppose, which is nice. I like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think you're involved in something like that. I did something like that in Germany um, in, from 1992 to 94. I did five live Saturday night shows and um, with this guy who's sort of, oh, he's like a, like a famous German TV presenter. It doesn't mean anything to anyone in the UK, but in Germany, he's a big star. And I did these little improvised sketches, little comedy sketches, and the contestants on the programme had a little challenge and in five of these shows, I was their challenge. So they had to come up with a clever way. And I didn't know exactly what they were going to do. And I was doing it in German, so I had to improvise. Not only that, it was live television. So there were 1,500 people in this huge, it was usually a sports hall, massive audience, as I said, 1,500 people. But it was being watched live by between six, seven, eight million people throughout Germany. So like, no, no pressure. But the people who work on that show, um, again, we're like family. And Mariana, who is um, one of the um, secretarial people on it, I actually sent her a message a couple of weeks ago, just catching up, seeing how she is, you know. When, when you do a show like that, you, mm. you bond. You do, you do. And, um, of course, if anybody wants to, any fans out there listening to this want to, um, I'm sure they're more than welcome to join the Simon and the Witch Memory Board and post a message on there and ask you anything as well. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, I, I can, as you found out today from our, from our chat, um, you know, I'll, I'll try and give some sort of an answer. <laughs> and um, But, you know, um, there's... There won't be any salacious gossip because it wasn't that sort of a show. No. <laughs> it was just, it was just lovely and um, quite tricky for you know kids because you know when you're a kid and you're on a TV show and then you see yourself on telly and then of course you're only on you're only doing acting work for part of the time and then you go to your normal school you must get a little bit of a maybe a bit a bit of envy a bit of jealousy a few remarks. I mean, obviously, some people think you're really cool because you've been on telly, but other people might give you a hard time. So I was, I was, you know, I can see why, you know, some kids don't want to carry on with that thing because mm -hmm. it must be quite challenging, you know, because they they got to go back to just being, you know, that 12, 13, 14-year-old kid. Yeah, I, it's, it's not something that people really think about when they watch the show. You just no. see the character, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. We've Other child actors have had on this podcast before and other shows, um, most of them haven't continued and said like you know it was it was fun to do but um for whatever reason they just decided it wasn't what they wanted to carry on doing it, it was just nice at the time i um, mean it's a, an interesting story to tell to people but some of them don't even tell people you know like it's only their their family or their friends that go do you know who this is and they're like oh no not again <laughs> and um so to wrap things up so if anybody wants to see what you're up to or anything like that um you also have a website as well that people can check out and uh, a show reel as well oh yeah, yeah there's all sorts of stuff it's easy um i've just made it simple my name's joe grossi so it's joe grossi.com so it's nice and easy <laughs> I'll get more work <laughs> so joe it's been lovely chatting to you today and reminiscing about simon the witch thank you for your memories and all the best in the future Thank you, Jack. It was uh, lo lovely to, to chat to you. Thanks for your questions. And uh, thank you for putting me in a TARDIS and <laughs> taking me back a long, long time. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. A big thanks to Joe for taking part. And as I mentioned, if you remember Simon and the Witch, do follow the Simon and the Witch Memory Board on Facebook. Well, that's it from me for now. Next up will be the final episode of Series 3. So look out for that. Until then... Goodbye for now.